Hi, welcome back to another uh, episode of our Monday live show. I am Pastor Joel Webin with Right Response Ministries, and we do this every Monday, usually at 2 p.m. Central. We're a little bit early today um, just because of scheduling conflicts. But uh, what I want to discuss is the post-millennial view of the rapture. Um, I've had some people ask, you know, well, uh, do post-millennials even believe in a rapture? What is their view of the rapture? You know, I was thinking uh, just last uh, night in our Sunday evening service at Covenant Bible Church, where I pastor in Central Texas, uh, we were singing, um, wow, what was the song? Blessed Assurance. Um, blessed Assurance, uh, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste. Of, and so we we're singing that, and there was one particular verse in the song uh, that says, uh, Visions of Rapture. Um, I think it's visions of rapture burst into sight. And I was thinking, you know, I probably need to explain this even to my congregation uh, sometime soon because, you know, we're singing this and everyone, you know, in the congregation knows uh, that, that I'm post-millennial and most of the members of the church are also in their eschatology uh, post-millennial. And here we are singing this song that has the word rapture in it, you know, that, uh, um, and they're probably, you know, like, can a post-millennial sing this song? Which I believe they can um, because it's not specific. It doesn't say a secret rapture. Um, it doesn't say a rapture that's coming, you know, um, uh, next Thursday. And, it, you know, so um, I think it's perfectly conducive with the post-millennial eschatology, uh, that particular song, Blessed Assurance, uh, and the way that they use the word rapture. But anyways, it just got me thinking in my local setting, pastorally, but then also publicly, I've had people ask the same kind of question. So I thought, you know what, this will probably be a brief video, but I just want to explain um in general, what, what is the post-millennial view of the rapture? And it's not that post-millennials don't believe there is any kind of rapture. We do believe in a rapture. And that might surprise you. You probably have been, many of you, under the impression that post-millennials uh, don't believe there is a rapture at all. Uh, but we technically, to be fair, we do believe in a rapture. It's not a secret rapture, but we do believe in a rapture. And I'm going to show you um, the way we view from the scripture uh, what that rapture looks like. But real quick, before I do, uh, let me make a, a brief announcement and also offer a brief word uh, for one of our sponsors. So the announcement is this. We've got our March conference, March 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. That's a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of next year, 2024. It's coming up. We've got Doug Wilson, Brian Sauvé, Joe Boot, uh, myself, Michael Foster, and Dale Partridge, who are going to be speaking at this conference. The title is Blueprints for Christendom 2.0. We're going to be talking about seven particular doctrines that we think are uh, vital when it comes to stewarding and uh, and ruling, righteously ruling the world, um, exercising good stewardship, um, pushing back uh, the, the kingdom of darkness, pressing for the crown rights of King Jesus. So we're going to be talking about um, uh, reformed confessional theology. We're going to talk about covenant theology, uh, uh, biblical patriarchy, presuppositionalism, uh, Kyperianism, this all of Christ for all of life mentality, uh, general equity theonomy, and post-millennial eschatology. And so this conference is going to cover all seven of those doctrines. We're also going to have a few live panels, uh, one where we talk about biblical patriarchy. That's going to be with me and Doug and Michael Foster and also Eric Kahn from It's Good to Be a Man. And then we'll also uh, do a live panel um, the second day of the conference. Uh, the first one in Biblical Patriarchy will be on Friday. The second day, Saturday, uh, March 2nd, we'll do a panel on um, all things obscure and unhinged with uh, Brian Sauvé and uh, also Ben Garrett from uh, Haunted Cosmos podcast. They're going to do a panel with us. So uh, we're really excited about the conference. Uh, it'll also hold over to March 3rd, that Lord's Day, and um, and one of our speakers will stay over and preach the sermon, and I'll, I'll lead uh, everybody through the liturgy for that Lord's Day worship. So it's going to be a great time. If you haven't already registered, I encourage you to do so. Our early bird rate is running out. It's going to run out um, at the end of August. August 31st is going to be the very last day uh, for our early bird pricing. So if you haven't registered already, uh, you need to do so um, because the early bird pricing is running out. But also I've got a sneaking suspicion. Our Theonomy and Postmail conference that we held a couple months ago, uh, that sold out six months in advance. And I think this one might sell out even faster. The conference is in March. And we really, I, I'm not just trying to you know, use hyperbole to get you to buy the ticket right now today. I really think that we're going to sell out at least six months in advance, just like our last conference. So we, we've already done it with the last conference. It would not shock me if we did it again. So yeah, you want to get the early bird pricing, but you also just want to get a seat. So go to rightresponseconference.com, not Right Response Ministries, but in this case, rightresponseconference.com to register today. All right, quick word from our sponsor. We'll move on. 
There are very few things as important as fellowship. Taking the time to spread the gospel is our duty as Christians. But sharing the word over a warm cup of Squirrely Joe's coffee, now that is our passion. Like the caffeine coursing through their veins, Squirrely Joe's is energized by their calling and emboldened to model their relentless faith. Based in Olney, Illinois, their association with the endangered white squirrel isn't just a novelty. It's a reminder that His Majesty can appear in the most unexpected places, in a humble squirrel, through a chance conversation, and even in a simple cup of joe. Share coffee, serve humbly, live faithfully. Squirrely Joe's is owned and operated by Joe Morris, his wife Rachel, and their seven children. They believe in being a truly Christian business where Christ is in the DNA of the business. Joe also believes in living Coram Deo, that means before the face of God, in every aspect of life. Joe is also a pastor of a small Reformed church, and both Joe and Rachel are veterans of the U.S. Marine Corps and U.S. Army, respectively. They believe that Christians should be building a thoroughly Christian economy by doing business with other like-minded Christians. The coffee is also fantastic. So, don't delay. Visit squirrelyjoes.com to order your coffee today. Again, that's squirrelyjoes.com to order your coffee today. All right, so let's go ahead and look at some scripture. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If you're joining us just now with the live stream, we're talking about a post-millennial view of the rapture. Uh, the post-millennials do believe that there is a rapture. We deny that there is a secret rapture. Um, but we do believe in a rapture of sorts. And so I want to go ahead and explain um, the post-millennial view from the scripture of what that rapture looks like. So this is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting in verse 13. This is where the Apostle Paul is, uh, he's talking about the coming of the Lord and what happens to those who were Christians, who were in the Lord through faith, um, but who have fallen asleep. That is, those who have died. What about loved ones? who are Christians who have died. He's offering a sense of consolation and comfort uh, to his hearers saying, uh, those who died in the Lord are not utterly and finally lost. Okay, verse 13, 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning in verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, as the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. That's the end of the chapter. So that's first that. Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 through 18. Okay, a couple things to point out here. Number one, um, it's interesting that it says uh, that we will be caught up, those who are alive. So first, the dead in Christ, that they'll be resurrected, brought out of the tombs, and that they will be caught up uh, to meet the Lord. Uh, then secondly, so first the dead in Christ, then those of us who are still alive at his coming. So whenever the Lord comes, whatever gen generation that's in, everyone who has been a Christian but already dead, they will first be resurrected. That'll be the first sequence of events. Uh, but then secondly, those who are currently still alive on the planet who are also in the Lord, Christians, um, after the dead in Christ are raised, then those who are still alive in Christ will be caught up. Okay? Now, the word uh, that, that's significant for our discussion today is that phrase, two words, caught up. That's the rapture. Um, caught up. Uh, and, and that kind of concept and wording, it's, it's interesting because the, there's a very similar phrasing 
and certainly the same concept and principle uh, when Jesus tells the parable of the ten virgins, right? So if you're not familiar with that parable, it's the parable where Jesus says, you know, there are ten virgins and five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. Um, and what they were doing is they each had a lamp and they were waiting for the bridegroom. There was a wedding that was going to take place and they were going to be honored guests at this wedding and they didn't want to miss it. So they're waiting. They don't know exactly when, what the hour is that the bridegroom will arrive, but they know that he's coming and they want to be ready so that they're not shut out of the chapel hall, that they're, they're not shut out of the wedding. They want to be, um, to be present there. Now, the five foolish virgins, what happens is they're waiting all day, uh, but now it's coming into the night. And the five foolish virgins, they didn't bring extra oil to keep their lamp lit so that they could see in the darkness now that it's night. And so they've, they've run out of oil. And so what they do is they go to the five wise virgins who were prepared and they say, give us uh, some of your oil. And the five wise virgins, they say, no, I'm sorry. Uh, it's not malicious on the uh, five wise virgins part, but they say, no, um, if we give you some of our oil, then we ourselves may not have enough. And then we might both run out of oil. And then when the, the bridegroom comes, we'll all miss him. So I'm sorry. Um, so they say no. Then the five foolish virgins, uh, virgins, they go into town to buy more oil for their lamps. And then they're going to come back. But as they go away into town to buy more oil, because they were foolish and didn't prepare, didn't bring enough, the bridegroom comes. And when the bridegroom comes, he, he then comes um, and meets with those, those five wise virgins. They go out to meet the bridegroom and then they come in with him and go into the wedding hall and shut the door and the five uh, foolish virgins are shut out. They miss it. Now, all that being said, what's, what's significant is this for our purposes in terms of post-millennialism and, and the post-millennials view of the rapture. When the bridegroom, who represents Christ, when he comes, the five wise virgins, uh, what the parable says is that when they see him coming, they run out to meet him. Now think about that for a second. These five wise virgins who have been waiting for the bridegroom to do what? To come to their town, the one they're already in. They're not waiting for the, the bridegroom to come and take them away to another town. They've been waiting all day and now in, in well into the night for the, the bridegroom to come into their town. The wedding's going to take place in their town, but they're still waiting nonetheless to see him at a far off distance so that they might run out to meet the bridegroom, be caught up. That's actually the, the same similar wording, similar phrasing that these, uh, these five wise virgins would see the bridegroom coming and before he actually fully technically arrives in their town, touches down, so to speak, in their town, that they would run out of the town to meet him, but then to come back. And, and what's the purpose of that? Why not just wait till he gets all the way into town and then say, hey, great, we've been waiting for you. Well, because it, it's a sense of honoring the bridegroom. It's to show commendation, to show honor, to show uh, esteem that they're going to go out to meet him so that they, they would then function as his, um, his accompaniment, his welcoming committee to usher the king, or in this case, the bridegroom, into the town. They're going to come out to meet him. Um, you know, one, one practice that a lot of people don't really do anymore, but I, I think is um, a wonderful, uh, good habit, is it... Uh, there was a time, you know, where not that long ago, where if you invited a family over to your house, you were going to have a company, you were going to have guests, um, and you invited them at a certain time, um, instead of just waiting for a knock at the door, um, you might have waited outside, actually. You might have waited outside uh, in the driveway, waiting for them to pull up, uh, waving, you know, so when you see them coming, um, uh, you, you would be able, before they even step out of the car, to be able to welcome them and say hello and wave and be warm and, and hospitable and then welcome them into your home. Well, so it was with the five virgins. They weren't, they weren't on, the, on the fringe, the edge of the town, so that they could see the bridegroom because he wasn't going to stop. He was going to just pass on by their town. And so they needed to be on the edge of town so they could see him. And when they saw him uh, run out to meet him to go somewhere else to, to the next town, which where he was, was actually headed as his destination. No, he's headed to their town. 
He's headed to their town, but yet they're waiting. It seems as though the picture being conveyed is they're waiting at the edge of town for the bridegroom so that they can spot him before he actually fully gets into town, not so that they can run out with him to go somewhere else, but so they can run out with him in order to be his welcoming committee to come back to the very same town where these five wise virgins were to begin with. That being said, how does that apply to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the rapture? The post-millennial view of the rapture is that we believe um, that those who are first dead in Christ, when fi Christ finally returns, his final physical return, when that happens, that those who are dead in Christ, that they'll be resurrected and caught up in the air to meet with Jesus. Then those who are living, whatever generation of Christians are still alive when Christ returns, they then will be caught up into the air with Christ. And then what's going to happen? Well, the text only says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the text only explicitly says, um, then we will be with the Lord always. It says, um, verse 17, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up. That's that rapture kind of uh, language. Caught up together with them, that is the Lord and those who were dead in Christ, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. But it doesn't say we're going to meet with the Lord in the air, and so we will then live in the air, in the clouds, forever. No, it just says we'll always be with the Lord. Where, though, with the, with the Lord? We'll be with the Lord. We know that. But where will we be with the Lord? Here. Here. We're going to go up, like the five virgins, going out of this world, just like they went out from their town, to welcome the Lord, they welcome the bridegroom, we welcoming the bridegroom and the king of all the earth saying, welcome, we've been waiting for you. And then we're going to become his accompaniment, accompaniment, his welcoming committee to then turn right back around and usher the king to his domain. This earth made new, the new heavens brought to the new earth to dwell with him here. But that is the rapture in the post-millennial view. So what I'm saying is this, uh, the post-millennial, we do not reject a rapture in every, in all of its forms, in the technical sense. In the technical, biblical sense, we believe that there is a rapture. Uh, but we don't believe that there are going to be multiple comings of the Lord in the sense that he's going to come in and do a secret rapture of the church first, while the dead in Christ are still dead and buried. And then there's going to be, you know, seven years of tribulation and then he'll come again. You just, you have to stop for a second and acknowledge that is multiple comings of Christ. That's Christ coming once for a rapture, then coming again after the tribulation. That's if you're pre-trib. If you're mid-trib, it's still multiple comings. It's uh, the, the tribulation starts, three and a half years go by, then Christ comes for a secret rapture of the church. And then you know, uh, those who are living in Christ, they're, they're alleviated of their suffering. They go to be with Christ in heaven somewhere else. Then you got three and a half years of tribulation still on the clock. That clock uh, runs out and then Christ comes back again um, for those who are have converted during those three and a half years and those who are dead in Christ to be resurrected, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that's multiple comings. Um, that's a secret rapture. Um, we believe uh, as post-millennials that there will be um, a rapture. We will be caught up with Christ, um, but it's going to be simultaneous with his final return. It's not him coming in a secret way to rapture only those who are in the church. To whereas if you're a non-believer, you know, you're walking around, you know, or like the Left Behind series, you know, you're driving and then all of a sudden there's all these traffic jams and, and car accidents because all the Christians, you know, got, got raptured out of the car and there's no one behind the wheel anymore. And it just happened and nobody saw it, right? All the unbelievers, none of them saw Jesus. No, no, no. They'll see him. Everybody will see him. It won't be a secret. When Jesus returns, he will return in the air. The whole world will see him. Um, and and those who were dead in Christ will be resurrected and caught up, raptured up with him in the air, in the clouds. Then those who were currently living in Christ, living Christians of that generation, when he returns, they'll be caught up into the air. And then we will welcome the king as his accompaniment, his welcoming party, his uh, cavalade to usher the king to touch down to the earth, to his kingdom that has been delivered to him. That's the post-millennial view of the rapture. It's not secret, and it's also, it does not precede his final return. So it's not pre-trib or mid-trib. 
Um, but rather, it's it's all one foul swoop. It's one event. It's it's two things happening happening simultaneously. It's the uh, the church, those who are dead in Christ, and then those who are living in Christ. The church being caught up, raptured, to then come with Jesus to touch down. So it's it's one fa- so it's rapture coming, rapture coming, uh, landing on on the earth, and the earth then made new. Uh, the new heavens brought to the new earth. So that is the post-millennial view of the rapture. We don't deny, uh, we don't say that there is no rapture. Uh, we believe that um, that we will be caught up. That is biblical language. But we deny a secret rapture uh, to be caught up and then ushered off somewhere else. We believe we will be caught up to meet Jesus at a halfway point, for lack of a better phrase, in the air. Jesus having come from heaven, us having been caught up from earth, meeting him in the air to then um, be his, his, um, his welcoming committee, as I've already said, you know, this, um, this kingly royal um, uh, bringing, you know, declaring, uh, you know, hear ye, hear ye, here comes the king, make way for the king and, and coming down with him. Um, honoring him, esteeming him, but also in a sense sharing in his glory as those who have union with Christ, as those who are co-heirs sharing with the king in that kingly royal glory as he comes and touches down to the earth, um, his kingdom being delivered to him. And so um, that's the post-millennial view of the rapture. So we don't deny the rapture, but we do deny a secret rapture. Uh, We deny uh, the idea that Christ is going to come secretly, that unbelievers won't see him, only the church will, and that he's going to rapture us, um, but not actually come and establish his kingdom, but just rapture us and take us somewhere else while something's still going on here on earth, and then he'll come another time. Um, that's not the post-millennial view. Now, to be fair, because I can just, I, I know other guys of uh, different eschatological persuasions might say, well, post-millennials, you still believe in multiple comings, and that's true. We do. Uh, we believe, you know, and everybody does in a sense. We believe that Christ came in the incarnation. That was his first coming, um, his earthly ministry 2,000 years ago. So we believe, uh, all Christians believe that in his first coming. Um, and then dispensational primo uh, Christians, depending on whether or not they believe in a pre-trib or mid-trib, uh, they believe in not two comings, but actually, you know, it's not a second coming. It would be a third coming. You know, there's uh, there's three, at least three comings. Some some persuasions of dispensation, although it's rare, it's not the, the majority report, but some dispensationalists, if you break it down, it's even four comings. And so uh, the dis- dispensational pre mill guy is going to say uh, usually three comings, um, that, that Christ came in the incarnation 2,000 years ago. We all affirm that. Uh, then Christ will come a second coming in the rapture, uh, but there'll still be more tribulation uh, to go, and then he'll come his third time uh, when the tribulation is over. Um, and post-millennials, likewise, we believe in multiple comings. The incarnation, that's the first coming of Christ in the incarnation, his earthly ministry 2,000 years ago. Um, and then and then also uh, this coming in a spiritual coming on the clouds, clouds signifying judgment in this case, uh, per Joel chapter chapter 2, uh, that following the first half of Joel chapter 2, Pentecost, pouring out my uh, God's Spirit on on all flesh, sons and daughters prophesying. That happened at Pentecost. Peter says that's the fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. But then the second half of Joel chapter 2 is that he'll come on the, on the clouds. There will be billows and clouds of smoke and the sun will be blotted out um, and turned uh, to blood red. Um, that's judgment language. And so Joel 2, the first half is Pentecost. The second half is judgment. So the, the post-millennial, we believe that um, that Pentecost was a fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. But then AD 70 was the, the, uh, the second half of that fulfillment of Joel chapter 2, that there's uh, the pouring out of the Spirit, um, and that Acts chapter 2 is a fulfillment of Joel chapter 2 in Pentecost, but then AD 70 in the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple was uh, the second half of that fulfillment of Joel chapter 2, that it's both, um, that, it, that it was Pentecost, outpouring of the Spirit, but then also it was uh, judgment, and that that was a, a coming of Christ. Um, it was a local coming, not global, uh, to Jerusalem. It was a local coming and it was a spiritual coming. But that was, in a sense, we could say that was a return of Christ. So Christ came once in the incarnation. He came twice in AD 70. That's a partial preterist view uh, that many postmillennials, not all, but many postmillennials hold. Uh, that was a local spiritual coming. And then there will be the final physical um, worldwide coming of Christ. And that will be the rapture and boom. Uh, touching down on earth, the end of, of this gospel age, 
uh, the end, the culmination, the final culmination of human history as we know it um, at the same time, simultaneously, one foul swoop. Rapture caught up, but not to go somewhere else as something still happens here on earth without us. Um, nope, caught up and then touched down. Um, so raptured up, just like the five wise virgin, uh, virgins go out to meet the bridegroom and then immediately come right back in for, uh, for the end of all things. So that's a post-millennial view of the rapture. Um, that, uh, you know, I mean, you can't describe a general view of anybody's position because there's, there's always going to be distinctions and multiple different positions, subcategories within a certain category. But so not every post-millennial necessarily holds to that, but many do. Uh, many do. So all that being said, uh, last thing real quick before we go, uh, you might have seen some of the uh, some of the controversy online, especially with Twitter right now about my book. Uh, so if you want to check it out and you want to actually give me um, a fair chance at explaining myself and uh, and not just straw man, but actually uh, look at the book and look at the biblical arguments that are made. Certainly people will disagree and that's fine for Christians to disagree, but it's good to disagree fairly, to actually know what uh, the position is and to know the biblical arguments and then be able to use the Bible uh, to refute them uh, if you still disagree. So check out the book. It's called Fight by Flight. Um, again, I'll hold it up. Fight by Flight. Subtitle is Why Leaving Godless Places is Loving Godless Places. Uh, Michael Foster, he he wrote um, an endorsement. Steve Dace uh, from The Blaze, he wrote an endorsement. I was on his show recently talking about the book. Meg Basham from The Daily Wire and Doug Wilson forwarded it. You can go to Amazon.com um, or you can go to RightResponseMinistries.com get a copy of the book. And then lastly, here's one final word from uh, our last sponsor of the day. With the banking industry in another tailspin and the Fed ready to raise interest rates once again, many of you are probably asking, when does this madness stop? If you're interested in learning how to establish a family banking system outside of today's mainstream banking insanity, then schedule a call with our sponsors at Private Family Banking. There's a way for individuals, families, and businesses to put their hard-earned money to work continuously accruing compounding interest and then have those resources available as collateral for cash or for financing investments, businesses, college, and other major life expenditures without having to go to the big banks for loans. Income tax protected? safety from stock market losses, guaranteed rates of compounding interest, and the ability to store up an inheritance for your children's children and avoid the death tax on your estate. If this interests you, then email our friends at banking at privatefamilybanking.com. Again, that's banking at privatefamilybanking.com. Or you can give them a call at 830-339-9472. Again, that's 830-339-9472. Schedule your appointment today.